Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, this is the second session of the webinar uh, introduction to harmful alcohol bloom using NASA remote sensing observations. And in this session, we are going to focus on platforms and sensors for ocean observations, data access, and processing tools. I am Amita Mehta, and I'm going to be conducting today's session. This is the course outline. Uh, last week, uh, Sherry provided an excellent overview of harmful algal blooms. Today, we are going to see which remote sensing satellites and sensors help look at harmful algal bloom in water bodies, so especially coastal ocean, open ocean, and also in some inland water bodies. Uh, we're going to talk about how to access these satellite data which are publicly available, and there are also tools which help processing these data. So that is going to be the focus of today's talk. Uh, and the next two weeks, then, we'll talk about large-scale monitoring of HABs, especially in coastal environment. So before we start uh, today's session, uh, we want to provide information about our set website. Uh, you see this web address here. This is the website where you will find information about this webinar. Uh, all the presentation slides are available from this portal, as well as recording of the webinar uh, are available on, on, on this site. As uh, Sherry um, talked last week, the, there are two homeworks for this webinar session. Um, one will be uh, available after today's session, and the next homework, the second homework, will be available after session four of the uh, series. Um, and uh, to get a certificate of completion, uh, you should attend all the webinars live and complete both homework assignments. Homework assignments have to be submitted via Google form, and the links can be found on the RSET website. After you submit the assignments at the end of this webinar session, uh, you will be sent the certificate of completion, but it takes a couple of months uh, before the certificates are processed. And so uh, you will be provided with the certificate by Marinas Martins. If you do not uh, receive the certificate by uh, end of two months uh, after this webinar series is over, you can send her an email at this address. So to start with today's session, this is the outline. First of all, we will have a brief review of what Sherry covered last week. Then uh, I will talk about HAB detection using remote sensing, uh, what principles are used, and then talk about satellites and sensors specifically used for monitoring HABs, um, how these data set can be accessed. There are tools which can be used to process the data as well. And then finally, we'll have examples of some tools which are doing near real-time HAB monitoring. So just to so show the right-hand side shows a Landsat, that's a satellite uh, image, and that is showing algal bloom in Lake Erie in uh, 2014 uh, August. So week one review, we're going to look at what Sherry covered. So just to recap, what is harmful algal bloom? It is really colonies of algae and it is really a plant that live in fresh water or uh, salty ocean water. And when it grows uh, out of control, sometimes it also becomes toxic and then it becomes harmful. All algae are not harmful, but when they become toxic, they become harmful, especially to ecosystems and also to people or human health. So that is harmful algal bloom. Um, how it can be harmful. First of all, it creates toxins, uh, not only in water, also some can go into the atmosphere, as Sherry mentioned last week. Uh, they cause economic losses because they affect uh, fisheries, um, they impair drinking water, uh, smother benthic organisms, uh, they make 
water hypoxic or deplete oxygen, they impede visual predators, and they attenuate light for the submerged um, vegetation and coral systems. So these harmful algal bloom uh, have a wide ranging influence on ecosystems as well as on drinking water through drinking water on human life. A number of factors which cause harmful algal blooms are listed here. Uh, first of all, it's the nutrient loading or eutrophication in the ocean or water that uh, gives boost to HAB. Uh, so pollution, uh, SSTs or uh, water temperature, uh, warmer the temperature, the higher probability of getting HABs. Um, there are food web changes within the water, uh, there are new species introduced, or there could be change in flow in the water bodies, such as through major storms, runoff changes, there are through floods and drought also runoff in the water body changes, and that can give rise to a change in harbor bloom. Um, there are also uh, reasons we may not know yet, uh, because HABs are observed, and some of these factors do relate to um, causes of uh, HABs. So optical properties of HABs are useful for remote sensing because some HAB species, they have typical properties in optical uh, bands. They can be seen from remote sensing uh, observations, uh, especially like Cornea brevis is what uh, Sherry mentioned last time um, in detail. And they change color of the water sometimes, and that's why they're detected by satellite sensors. Uh, you must have heard about red tides in, in Florida or in oceans, which are sometimes related to HABs. But not all red tides are harmful, and not harmful blooms, they have discoloration of water. But when there is discoloration, usually uh, it helps detect uh, water quality. Um, since algae are uh, plant, plant colonies, basically chlorophyll is detected by remote sensing, um, and that helps uh, in monitoring HAB. So when HAB changes, chlorophyll changes also, and so detection of chlorophyll uh, helps in monitoring HAB. So especially what is seen is chlorophyll anomalies. Anomalies is departure from mean chlorophyll, uh, and so changing chlorophyll usually is uh, indicating a change in uh, harmful algal blooms. So with that background, we're going to talk about how HEB is detected using remote sensing. Sherry mentioned about um, optical remote sensing to use um, to monitor HEB. And so these are the parameters listed here. They are usually used uh, to detect presence of algal blooms. As we mentioned, chlorophyll A concentration is the main parameter that indicates change in algal bloom, um, especially when you take chlorophyll A concentration anomalies, they show a changing state of water. Uh, usually it is taken, as noted here, uh, two to three months mean chlorophyll is taken and then departure from that is considered uh, the anomaly and that uh, helps in detecting uh, new uh, colonies of algal bloom. Next parameter is sea surface temperature. So that also indicates warmer temperature and increased chlorophyll A concentration indicate uh, have uh, increase or change. Uh, in addition, optical characteristics especially absorption and backscattering of radiation, these are the parameters uh, that remote sensing uses uh, to, to see uh, help, uh, to have uh, bloom. This uh, right-hand side shows an example of a, an image. This is a lake in uh, Guatemala, uh, Lake Atitian in Guatemala. Uh, this is the uh, red, green, blue image. Uh, and here is what is shown is uh, chlorophyll concentration retrieved from this image. Uh, this is from Lancet again, and you can see the red and yellow colors they're showing where uh, chlorophyll A concentration is high, and that indicates 
uh, probability of uh, algal bloom in the lake. So we're going to talk about how um, remote sensing of HEB is performed. It uses reflected solar radiation in visible and near infrared bands. As shown in this figure, uh, sunlight is reflected from surface. There is also sunlight that penetrates in the water, and that is uh, backscattered. Some of the light gets absorbed in the water as well. And so the signal going back to the um, satellite sensor then is resolved in, in terms of optical properties. And that provides information about the state of water, especially if there is chlorophyll A present in the water, or there are other particulate or dissolved matter uh, that are present in the water, because they absorb and scatter uh, sunlight in visible and near infrared spectrum in specific way. And by knowing that, one can derive uh, chlorophyll A concentration and other water quality parameters as well. Um, you had your prerequisite of remote sensing for aquatic um, um, systems provides information about different bands um, and uh, what the band definitions are. So uh, if you haven't already looked at the prerequisite, please. Uh, review that to get more information about the bands. But this is the basic principle that is used to detect HAB from water. Another way to see um, is to look at thermal infrared uh, radiation. Thermal infrared radiation is emitted by uh, water surface. That is detected, and that is indicative of changes in surface temperature. So amount of radiation that is emitted is proportional to the changes in surface temperature. And so by detecting thermal infrared radiation, uh, one can derive temperature of the water. And that also helps in detecting HAB. There are a number of uh, satellites uh, launched by NASA as well as European Space Agency. And they carry sensors that measure visible and near infrared band reflectances as well as there are instruments they provide thermal infrared. Uh, so these data are available publicly, and they can be used to uh, derive um, chlorophyll A concentration, SSDs, and they indicate um, the presence of harmful uh, algal bloom. So we are going to overview some of these satellites and sensors, which are very useful for monitoring HAB and how to access this data. So some of you may already have used this data. Maybe uh, you have used uh, one of these satellite data. And if you have, please type in the chat box so that we know that you have used this data. If you are new to uh, remote sensing, you will have a series of satellites and sensors information as well as tool information that you can use. If you have already used this data, you can use this presentation as a reference because it provides a comprehensive catalog of all the satellite sensors and tools that you can go back anytime uh, for reference. Um, so we'll start with a number of satellite missions which are used for head monitoring, especially Landsat 7 and Landsat 8. They have been useful for a, a long time. Uh, Terra and Aqua, these two satellites, also have been used, um, as specifically an um, instrument MODIS flying on Terra and Aqua. It helps uh, in detecting HAB. Uh, a newer satellite, uh, the SUMI National Polar Partnership, or SNPP, uh, these first um, four satellites, so Landsat, Terra, Aqua, and SNPP, are NASA satellites. There are two additional satellites, Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3. These are European Space Agency satellites. They also provide um, measurements. They help in head monitoring. So we are going to review some of these satellite sensors. So Landsat um, is a longest running mission by NASA. The first Landsat was actually launched in 1972. And the latest one is Landsat 8. We are in Landsat 8 series now, and it's, it was launched in February of 2003. Currently flying Landsat missions are Landsat 7 and Landsat 8, so the coverage is 
from 1999 onwards. And there is also a new Landsat 9 mission planned that will be tentatively in 2023. So Landsat uh, 7 has a enhanced thematic mapper. This is the sensor flying on Landsat 7. Uh, so that helps in detecting uh, harmful algal bloom. So Landsat itself is like a polar orbiting satellite. It covers global um, uh, coverage, and then it has a swath width of 185 kilometers. So ETM plus, ETM plus has um, 185 kilometers swath width. Um, it has eight spectral bands as shown here. These are the ETM seven bands. They are pictorially shown here with wavelengths here. Um, and then you can see the band width as well. So these eight bands are in, in blue, green, uh, green, red, thermal infrared, and panchromatic bands. And uh, these bands have varying resolution from 15 meters, 13 meters, and 60 meters, respectively. So bands 1 and 5 and 7, they have 30 meter resolution, uh, as shown here. And then band um, 6 has 60 meter resolution, and band 8, which is the panchromatic uh, band, has 15 meter resolution. Uh, Landsat 7 uh, data are available uh, from April 1999 to present. Uh, all Landsat satellites have 16 day revisit time. That means the same location is observed every 16 days. So that's the temporal resolution. Uh, Landsat 8 has two instruments. Uh, operational land imager only and thermal infrared sensor TIRS. Um, more information can be found on the uh, websites given along with the slides. Uh, so Landsat 8 also is a polar orbiting satellite and has the same uh, characteristics. It provides global data and the SWOT width is 185 kilometers. Uh, OLI has multiple bands like ETM plus, but it has one more band. So there are nine bands in OLI. Um, in addition to uh, bands that were present in ETM plus, it has a shortwave or deep blue band that helps in detecting uh, coastal areas as well as it is sensitive in um, detecting reflectance by aerosols. Um, TIRS has two spectral bands. Only special resolution um, like ETM plus, it varies from 15 meter and 30 meter to 30 meters. And TIRS has special resolution of 100 meters. Uh, Landsat 8 data are available since February of 2013. And again, revisit time for Landsat 8 is 16 days. So both Landsat 7 and 8 data are available at 16 day interval. Here is more information about the bands themselves. Uh, you can see the band range in micrometers for Landsat 7 uh, ETM plus, and here is for Landsat 8 OLI and TIRS. You can see that there are blue, green to uh, near infrared and short wave infrared bands um, given here. These are the TIRS bands here in thermal infrared with 100 meters resolution. Again, this is the extra band um, that Landsat 8 has, uh, it's the deep blue that provides a better um, view of coastal areas. And then um, again, blue, green, red, and uh, near IR band can be seen in both these instruments. So these are used uh, for chlorophyll A detection, uh, sea surface temperature detection, especially for thermal infrared and they can help in detecting HAP. How to get Landsat images and bad reflectance data? You can see these three sites, and some of you may have already used these sites. Uh, USGS has these tools, Earth Explorer, um, Globix, and Landsat Look Viewer, and the site addresses are given here. All three can provide uh, Landsat images, and bad reflectances by uh, picking uh, different regions. And you can uh, pick different sensors through Earth Explorer and Globis as well. 
Landsat look viewer, as name suggests, it is for uh, Landsat uh, only. And then these two help in getting other sensors that we will see, such as MODIS. Uh, you can see from this uh, tools as well. Um, if you have you used any of these tools? Uh, if you have, then please let us know. If you're using Earth Explorer or Globe as a Landsat look to get any of the uh, satellite data, uh, please let us know. Uh, and uh, as you can see, you can zoom into your region of interest and get data in form of tiles. And you can just visually look at the images through these tools, or you can download band by band deflectances uh, also on your computer and then uh, process them further in digital form. So two satellites we talked about. Um, Terra and Aqua, they both are NASA satellites, both in pol polar orbits. Uh, Terra has equator crossing time of 10.30 a.m. p.m. So, and Aqua has 1.30 a.m. p.m. equator crossing time. So essentially, these two satellites can provide um, four times observations, um, as you can see. They both have global coverage. Terra was launched in December 1999 and Aqua in 2002. So that is the long-term coverage um, from these two satellites. And provide, as they are polar orbiting satellites, they provide one to two observations per day. They both carry multiple sensors as listed in the bottom. But the one that we're going to focus on is MODIS, which is, has uh, optical bands and near-infrared bands and that can be used for uh, HAP detection. So here's the information about MODIS. Uh, more information can be found from the MODIS website itself. Uh, the MODIS bands are shown here in red, uh, in, in green here. Um, there are actually 36 bands which uh, are designed to observe atmosphere, ocean, and land, everything. There are uh, a few bands that 8 to 15, bands 8 to 15, they are more in um, optical, such as red, blue, infrared, near infrared, and medium infrared range. They are used for uh, watch quality parameters, especially chlorophyll A concentration. Um, MODIS has a wide swath, uh, 23, 30 kilometers. So it has a good coverage of a uh, globe. Uh, special resolution varies with bands from 250 meters to one kilometer, but for HAP detection, the resolution is one kilometer. And these data are available uh, since 2002. So specific bands useful for HAP monitoring are listed here with one kilometer special resolution. And uh, these are the frequencies. As you can see, they have um, blue and uh, green and red and infrared uh, range of uh, bands shown here. The example on the right-hand side shows um, chlorophyll concentration derived from using MODIS data. Uh, and you can see the global oceans are covered. And um, water bodies such as Great Lakes or Lake Victoria in Africa, um, you can see some of the major water inland water bodies as well to uh, this data. So how to get MODIS data? Um, images and band reflectances can be obtained. Um, there is uh, NASA Earth's data uh, that provides information about uh, MODIS reflectances. Uh, so this site requires registration. And um, I forgot to mention that Landsat uh, tools that we talked about um, earlier, they also require user registration, but these data are all free and publicly available. So there is, um, once you uh, log in to uh, register to NASA Earth data, you can access a variety of data sets, and you can search data set, especially MODIS data set, through this. Um, direct download can be done from Land Processing Distributed uh, Active Archive Center, or LPDAC. And this is the website. And the MODIS products uh, can directly be downloaded. Uh, the band reflectances uh, for ocean bands are 8 and 16. 
they are available from this site. And specifically, the product names are uh, MOD for, so these are MOD ocean color, that's for Terra. And MY is for Aqua, so this is MYD um, ocean color from Aqua. So these products, they provide uh, band reflectances from MODIS, especially to, uh, for uh, useful for head monitoring, bands 8 and 16, 8, 8, 8 to 16. Next satellite we want to talk about is uh, SNPP, or National Polar Partnership uh, Satellite. This was launched in 2011, and it continues to provide measurements, uh, has global coverage, also is in polar orbit with 1.30 a.m. p.m., more like aqua um, a setting. It provides this, um, a.m. and p.m. 1.30 equator crossing time. Um, and there are multiple sensors, but the one that we're going to focus on is VIRS, which is Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, that is VIRS. And uh, that is similar to MODIS, so has similar functionality. It helps in uh, observing atmosphere, land, and water. Um, and so some of the bands on VIRS are useful for detecting HAB. It has a a uh, swath width of 3,000 kilometers, and special resolution is a little lower than MODIS, varies from 375 to 750 meters, depending on band. Um, and uh, here is the example shown in the right-hand side. Uh, the VIRS, this is the image that shows algal bloom in Caspian Sea in May. Uh, as you can see, uh, it shows a gold bloom occurring in some of the coastal regions and in the northern part of the Caspian Sea. These are the specific band uh, in micrometers. Um, and you can see, again, uh, some of the same uh, frequencies from blue all the way to near infrared with 750 meters resolution. Uh, these can be obtained um, and used to detect uh, HAB. Uh, again, here is an example of a phytoplankton bloom uh, in, in Gulf of Alaska in last year. And this also can, uh, is seen from VIRS. So um, just by looking at the images and by analyzing a little more, one can look at chlorophyll concentration as well as uh, that um, helps in detecting phytoplankton. And um, that's where uh, how uh, there is a possibility of harmful algal bloom um, there as well. To get the wheels band reflectance data, again, LPDAC is a good source. This is the site to go to. Uh, same place where you get MODIS band data, band, uh, spectral band data is the same, uh, can be used to get wheels data. Uh, the product name, uh, to focus on is this VNP09GA. Uh, this is the uh, VIRS spectral bands for uh, ocean color um, detection. And so that can be downloaded and further analyzed. We want to move on to um, a next satellite system. So we talked about Sentinel satellites, Sentinel-2 and 3, they are both uh, launched by European Space Agency. Um, Sentinel-2, again, is a system of two satellites. They are 180 degree apart. They're both in polar orbits, and they provide global coverage. As you can see in the right-hand side, uh, the animation shows the uh, coverage of um, entire globe by Sentinel-2A and 2B system. So these two satellites were launched in uh, 2015 and 2017, respectively. As you can see, 2A has been flying for um, about two years now, and um, uh, Sentinel-2B was launched earlier this year. Both the satellites combined together, they have five-day revisit time. And the instrument that helps in detecting ocean color, especially chlorophyll A concentration, is multispectral imager, or MSI. So MSI um, is um, 
on both 2A and 2B has a global swath, a global coverage and swath width of 290 kilometers. Uh, the spatial resolution is 10 meters, uh, especially for visible and near infrared bands. And the bands, again, um, you can zoom in and see. Uh, it's kind of hard to see on the slides, but they are shown here, all the bands. There are total 13 bands, but there are uh, four invisible and near infrared with 10 meter resolutions. There are also uh, red um, and short wave infrared. Uh, they, there are six bands, and there are specific bands for atmospheric correction. They have 60 meter resolutions, so they are pictorially shown here. And here is the table. Here is these numbers are in nanometers now, and you can see. Uh, all 12 bands listed here. Uh, the central uh, wavelength of this is provided here from blue all the way to near IR. And uh, these are the correction bands also uh, shown here with 60 meter resolution. Uh, the example here is shown, it shows algal bloom in Baltic Sea. This is uh, from using MSI and you can see uh, how um, clearly it shows um, where chlorophyll A concentration is high, and here is where uh, alcohol bloom is occurring. To get the MSI data, the same USGS tools are useful. So Earth Explorer um, and uh, Clovis, they provide um, information about, um, they say, Similar to Lancet uh, look, there's Sentinel-2 look also. And here is the website. Both of these provide information um, about MSI data. You can download the data or you can view images. There is a European Space Agency site or ESA Copernicus Open Hub. This also provides Sentinel data. This site also requires user registration. Um, and once the registration is approved, you can download the data. So, um, so um, next satellite we want to talk about is Sentinel-3. Uh, Sentinel-3, again, like Sentinel-2, is a two-satellite system. The one Sentinel-3A is already launched in February of 2016, and 3B will be launched pretty soon. Uh, the global, it has global coverage. The revisit time here is 27 days. The sensor, there are multiple sensors as usual, uh, but the one that uh, focuses on ocean color is OLCI. Uh, OLCI, or Ocean and Land Color Instrument, um, as shown here, has a global swath, uh, global coverage and a swath of 270 kilometers. Uh, this instrument is similar to the one that flew on NVSAT. The instrument was called MERIS, or Medium Resolution Imaging Spectrometer. Um, some of you may have already used MERIS data to detect ocean color. Um, and so, so OLCI has um, similar features as MERIS, um, has um, 21 spectral bands. Um, they, several invisible and near infrared range. The resolution here is 300 meter. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the revisit time is 27 days. So these are specific bands for your information uh, that OLCI provides uh, measurements in. Again, uh, visible and near infrared bands can be seen here. Um, um, and uh, they all uh, have different varying width, the bandwidth. Um, so they are used for detecting algal bloom. Here there is a map of a chlorophyll A concentration based on OLCI. Um, and you can see where there are darker colors in the coastal region. That's where there is high concentration of um, chlorophyll A. And where there is high chlorophyll, um, there are uh, planktons blooming and algae blooming and some of them can be harmful. To get OLCI data, there are two possible ways. One is NOAA Coast Watch. Um, this 
we are going to talk about this tool um, later in this presentation, but this provides OLCI data. Uh, another site is UMETSET site. The, uh, the uh, link is provided here, and here you can search and uh, find OLCI uh, level one data um, from Sentinel-3. So these, again, UMETSET site requires registration, uh, but these two are uh, perfectly good sites where easily you can download OLCI data. So we talked about uh, all the satellites and instruments. Just to summarize, we talked about Landsat, uh, ETM Plus and OLI. We talked about Terra and Aqua Modis. We talked about Sentinel 2A and 2B MSI. We talked about uh, Sentinel 3 OLCI. And uh, last but not the least, we talked about VIRS flying on SNPP. All these instruments carry visible and near to near infrared spectral bands, which are useful for detecting HABs. But there are also some limitations that we want to point out here. So first of all, as Sherry mentioned, remote sensing observations cannot replace in situ measurements. In fact, in situ measurements are required to, use, to be used along with remote sensing uh, observations for accurate and quantitative uh, HAB monitoring. So they both, in situ and remote sensing data have to be co-analyzed to get, to get uh, HAB, uh, HAB, harmful algal bloom. Sometimes it is difficult to separate um, ocean color changes because of different reasons, not just chlorophyll A, but sedimentation or dissolved organic matter, they can change water color. And so just to isolate chlorophyll A um, from that uh, is sometimes difficult. However, there are techniques used where band combinations are used to reduce this um, impact and derive chlorophyll A concentration. However, that is something to keep in mind. Uh, depending on what kind of water you're looking at, uh, the interpretation depends on that. Also, important thing to note is that just by looking at um, remote sensing data and detecting algae, it is not easy to say that it's, it's a toxic algal bloom, so it is harmful or it is just um, harmless algal bloom. So that is a limitation, so in situ data help in confirming that it is harmful algal bloom. Um, also, uh, spectral, special temporal resolutions play a big role in how accurately HAP can be monitored, especially in coastal region and inland water bodies. Over open oceans, it may be easier, but when there is mix of land and um, water bodies present, uh, it requires careful analysis of observations and then limitations with special resolution uh, of, the, of the instrument. Uh, as Sherry mentioned, again, remote sensing uh, ref reflectances, they have to be corrected for atmospheric contribution, especially from not just atmospheric gaseous molecules, but from aerosols and clouds as well. So these um, reflectances have to be corrected. And when um, it's totally cloudy or cloud cover is very large, optical remote sensing sometimes cannot even see the surface. So in that case, uh, it is difficult to get any uh, head monitoring done. So these are some of the limitations. But in spite of all the limitations, there are many studies and there are many tools that have successfully used remote sensing instruments and uh, measurements uh, especially these band reflectances, um, combination of band reflectances to get chlorophyll A concentration, also sea surface temperature, salinity, all these measurements can be obtained from remote sensing. And then they provide um, ocean color information. They can indicate HAB. So we're going to provide overview of some of these satellite-based ocean color data access tools where already data are available. So we want to talk about, we're going to focus specifically on chlorophyll A 
air concentration and sea surface temperature or water temperature data, uh, which these two are the most important parameters for HAB monitoring. And so there are two types of tools. The one listed here on left-hand side is the tool that enables data search, uh, temporal and spatial subsetting, um, and anal analysis and visualization. So there are two such tools, Ocean Color Web and Giovanni. We will briefly review those. And there is a more advanced tool that is shown here on the right-hand side. That's an image processing tool. It also helps visualization, but it also is a package, a software package, that you download on your computer and then do image processing. It is called CDAS. So brief overview of these tools are pro provided here. So Ocean Color Web, um, it, it was developed for collection and processing and validation of in situ and ocean related products from remote sensing. Um, it provides information of chlorophyll A concentration and sea surface temperature. Uh, there are level one, level two, and level three data are available from this site. So level two data are, again, um, pixel level data, whereas level three data are gridded data. So they're ready-made available. So you don't have to download band reflectances from, say, MODIS or VIRS. You already have derived products here, chlorophyll A concentration SST. They can be accessed here. And uh, uh, Ocean Color Web also provides link to CDAS. Uh, which can be downloaded for uh, more advanced processing of uh, ocean color data. So this is the um, ocean color website, data search and access. Um, it has multiple missions. So MODIS uh, is available. Um, OCTS actually is a uh, ocean color and temperature sensor from a Japanese satellite. Um, OLCI we talked about, which is on Sentinel-3, uh, and uh, VIRS on SNPP. These are available uh, from Ocean Color Web. And by select, after you select which sensor you are interested in, you can also get a, a browsing capability, uh, as shown here. You can have, um, you can look at the data, or you can download the data uh, through different options here, either direct data access, or you can search for a specific data file. You can subscribe to data as well. And there are multiple options uh, 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 in formatting available. Open DAP format also is available. So this is the uh, visualization and search part of Ocean Color Web. This is level one and level two data. Uh, on top, you can see there is a parameter selection, SST and chlorophyll A. Um, you can pick MODIS or VIRS uh, allows you to pick the pixel width or a, uh, width um, in selection in size. Um, it allows to zoom in to any area. There are several predefined regions also, such as um, Aegean Sea or Arabian Sea, Adriatic Sea. These are all predefined regions that you can pick. Or you can zoom into any region. Uh, there is a time selection here, uh, year, uh, this is month and day. So daily data can be viewed, level one and two, from MODIS um, on, from this side and from VIRS as well. So it further, uh, there is direct access to data files. Um, and data available are chlorophyll A, uh, for surface temperature, and IOPs, or inherent optical properties, such as absorption and backscattering coefficients. Ocean Color Web also provides level three data, uh, which are gridded data. And these data uh, are available at uh, different resolutions, um, such as uh, nine kilometers. There's also a four kilometer product available. And you can pick VIRS or MODIS um, from the standard product table. And there's a temporal selection uh, as shown here. Uh, you can see the maps of the global uh, chlorophyll concentration uh, and surface temperature, or you can uh, pick any specific month or AT composite um, from this. So there are multiple options 
just to view the data and then you can by clicking on that particular uh, file you can download the file as well so this brings to the second tool that we talked about this is Giovanni so this tool has um, certain more features it allows um, analysis here you can do maps so that is uh, geographic mapping there's also a time series option um, and there are some miscellaneous you can do histogram analysis as well it allows a keyword search so in here Giovanni has many many data sets but if you type chlorophyll it provides uh, all the chlorophyll data available uh, on this site and this particular one example shown here is a, a modis uh, aqua chlorophyll a concentration at four kilometer resolution it provides um, the data coverage so this is 2002 July to um, June of 2017 and it provides which units so um, this is if you click on this any of these parameters it provides detailed information of how uh, of that parameter itself um, so uh, this after picking there's also a special selection here through map um, and uh, you can plot data and visualize data so this is the uh, result of uh, search and this is the chlorophyll concentration in Gulf of Mexico this was the map chosen just for example this is January of 2017 monthly data and so you see time series so averaged chlorophyll a concentration from 2010 to 2000 to 2017 uh, this is monthly chlorophyll concentration averaged over this region you can see from here in milligram per meter cube so you can do analysis and also then can download this data in multiple formats you can have images or geotiff images KMZ files which you can view with Google Earth uh, or you can have NetCDF file which you can further manipulate with any other uh, software package so Giovanni uh, has uh, analysis the only thing is that the modis data available here are monthly data not daily so for daily data ocean color web is more useful for analysis and looking at long-term variability Giovanni is useful so again by clicking on on any of these files you can download on your computer brings us to the third thing that we talked about the CDAS uh, this is actually an analysis package and it's a um, comprehensive image analysis packaging that was developed for processing displaying uh, in data and there's also quality control of ocean color data through this uh, site this is not um, an this is not um, automatic this tool uh, has to be like you need advanced training to use this tool there is a tutorial available on the CDAS site uh, there are multiple versions uh, it's constantly improving the CDAS version 7.4 is the latest version available and this was developed in collaboration with European Space Agency uh, beam software package um, so some of you may have used either beam or earlier version of CDAS and this is the tab where you can click and download software on your computer so you have to download this on your computer to be able to use um, there are features uh, shown here all the visualization features shown here um, is uh, there's um, um, the coastline and land water mask in addition to there is a layer management available through ESRI uh, shapefiles. Uh, there is very fast image display and navigation uh, for big uh, images. Uh, there is accurate reprojection and auto rectification uh, to any common map projection. So there are uh, multiple options in visualization. And then there is processing, uh, which is level 0 to level 1 processing. Uh, and some of it can be customized there is temporal binning for uh, level 3 um, and uh, these are the, the 
there is flexibility in how you can process data for your own use in your own region. There is a visualization only version where you just visualize data or if you want to process data, if you want to actually analyze um, correct data, you want to rebin data according to your need, then you need to download um, an install package and then um, it depends on your computer system. So for each system, uh, if it is Linux or if it's Mac, it's a uh, different version that you have to download. And um, then there are requirements listed here, which program are listed, which languages are, are, are required, such as Java or Python or Bash. Um, these are um, required on your computer. So this is truly an advanced tool. And uh, there's a tutorial online that you can go through to know more about CDAS and how to use it. This is just a quick example of high resolution um, Lancet image uh, from, from uh, CDAS. And it also provides um, um, histogram as shown here for, for green. Um, and so you can quickly analyze data uh, by using uh, CDAS. So these three tools, Ocean Color, uh, Web, Giovanni, and CDAS, in, they can be used um, to first to, to get products directly, and third one, uh, CDAS, to analyze products. You can use these tools. But now we're going to talk about some tools which already provide have monitoring capability. So these are ready-made tools which are already used by end users. And one such tool that I want to um, talk about is chlorophyll A and SST monitoring using MODIS and Landsat 8. It is um, University of South Florida uh, has Optics uh, Marine Lab that is providing this uh, capability. What it does, it uses MODIS and Lancet data in a number of regions listed here. So in Caribbean, East Asia, North America, uh, South America, South Pacific, West Africa, Persian Gulf. Um, and there are specific regions for which Lancet data uh, are used. These are all MODIS. This is Lancet 8. There is, uh, so satellite data, um, ocean colored product like chlorophyll A uh, and uh, SSTs are available for these regions. In addition, there is a virtual buoy products. What it does is there are several buoys in, in these regions. So satellite overpasses are taken at buoy location and uh, chlorophyll A and temperature and other optical properties are provided at buoy locations. So this helps uh, validating and comparing uh, buoy and ocean data, and so it's called virtual buoy from remote sensing data. So uh, once you go to the um, website, uh, here is an example of ocean color data from Aqua and Terra MODIS. You can, this is particularly from MODIS, um, and this is August 2017, 10th. Oh, these are the parameters available. Uh, you can click uh, for more information, uh, this one is chlorophyll A. Um, and then you can see there are other SST is here. There are other optical properties are available from uh, this site as well. And more information, uh, details can be found by uh, clicking on this link. And uh, so they will provide RGB images as well. Um, and derived quantities uh, for selected region as uh, shown here. So by the way, this is Eastern Caribbean region, but you can pick any region and this data will be available. So you can just visualize or you can download this data as well. So for virtual buoy stations, these are the buoys available in Gulf of Mexico and in Persian Gulf. Um, and there's the reference provided with more information uh, where uh, MODIS and Landsat 8 data are used. Here is the example. Here is a buoy location in Tampa Bay. So once you pick a buoy location, you can get weekly, monthly, 
uh, weekly last year, uh, monthly last year, and climatology, so mean of many years data of SSD, chlorophyll A, turbidity, secutistic, uh, KD coefficient, and uh, light penetration in percentage. Um, as you can see, not always all data are available um, in, in, in recently uh, when the week is going on, but you will see that uh, other data uh, are available, and they are available at that location. Once you pick the buoy location uh, with particular latitude longitude, it provides information from satellite as well as from buoy. Next uh, tool is Cyanobacteria Assessment Network, or Cyan. This is a collaborative program among EPA, NOAA, NASA, and USGS, and uh, we are going to talk in detail on week four. Uh, we have a guest speaker from EPA who will describe the tool. This is a web application or a cell phone application also that can be used uh, for early algal bloom, um, and it uses the Landsat, Sentinel-2, and Sentinel-3 data uh, to monitor HAB or cyanobacteria bloom. And this is really a decision support tool that uh, stakeholders can use uh, to monitor uh, in near real time uh, have, mon have bloom. We'll have uh, more information in week four. Um, another such tool is Lake Erie HAP Tracker. Uh, this is from NOAA, and this uses MODIS satellite. Um, it also uses weather forecast information, and it has a model currents in Lake Erie, so it provides not only have measurements, in situ measurements, remote sensing based, um, in situ, uh, in remote sensing based uh, have information, and it also has five day forecasts based on weather information and uh, Lake Erie uh, model. It provides information five day out, uh, what kind of um, chlorophyll concentration can be expected or can have be expected or not. And this, is, this shows a snapshot from the Airy, Lake Erie HAP tracker. Um, by going to this site, you can get more information on the many features that the site provides. Uh, this is just an example of modis derived cyanobacterial density. So this combines in situ measurements and satellite measurements um, to provide this information. And this is, again, uh, a recent uh, in, in August of this year, you can see cyanobacterial density. Next tool is NOAA Coast Watch. Uh, this uh, tool uses remote sensing data to understand uh, and managing oceans. And as a part of that, it provides HAB monitoring capability. Uh, and you can see satellite products used for Coast Watch are given here. Um, and then uh, other uh, information which data are available, which tools are available, uh, it's provided through Coast Watch. There is Coast Watch, there is Ocean Watch, and there is Polar Watch. So there are information provided in multiple areas. Um, satellite products are available in true color imagery, um, ocean color radiances, um, and chlorophyll A concentration, sea surface temperature, height and salinity and winds, they're all available from Coast Watch. Um, this is an example um, of harmful algal bloom uh, in Gulf of Mexico in, in earlier this year. And as you can see, high concentration along the coastline here. Um, and this is the uh, three-day composite um, based on um, MODIS. It also uses WEARS data and also uses Sentinel-3 OLCI data to derive chlorophyll concentration and have uh, monitoring. Um, there is a European Union tool which is called Copernicus Marine Environment Monitoring Service. Um, provides uh, HAB monitoring capability in North Atlantic, Arctic Ocean, Baltic Sea, Black Sea, Mediterranean Sea. Uses MODIS and WEIRS as noted here. And here's a snapshot of the website. Again, you need registration, but you can use this uh, site to look at the um, uh, 
had monitoring capability, especially chlorophyll A concentration in these oceanic uh, regions. Um, there is a near real time algal bloom monitoring service in North Atlantic. This uses information from this Copern Copernicus Marine Environment Site, and it provides information specifically um, in the North Atlantic where uh, algal bloom might be occurring. As shown here in the example, chlorophyll A concentration uh, is shown here again in uh, August of 2017. This is um, based on Modis and Weir's data. So these are some of the tools which provide, um, have monitoring capability, just visualization, or one can download data as well. So we had a lot of information in this presentation. Um, we talked about satellite sensors, about some tools where uh, ocean color data are available directly, and some tools which are used by stakeholders to look at chlorophyll A concentration and uh, have um, detection capability for uh, for decision making. Uh, some of the tools we saw uh, at the end, uh, they are already um, in use uh, for decision support. So to summarize, um, the remote sensing provides continuous global coverage with consistent observations, and which compared to limited point measurements uh, of surface or ship-based uh, sampling, it has a much wider coverage. It provides continuity. Uh, so that is a positive uh, contribution from remote sensing. And optical and near-infrared remote sensing observations from Landsat, Terra, Aqua, MODIS, SMPP, Weirs, Sentinel-2 MSI, Sentinel-3 uh, Sentinel OLCI. They are professionally used for qualitative and quantitative detection and monitoring of HEB through chlorophyll concentration and SSD monitoring. So we hope that this information will be useful to you as a reference material. And as we go through next two weeks, you will see reference to some of the material, some of the satellites and sensors we covered in this um, session today. Um, so thank you uh, for attending this webinar. And so next week, we will talk about understanding HABs in the coastal environment. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, type them in the chat box, and we'll be very happy to answer the questions. Thank you again. Can we monitor red tide daily? So if, if the tides are, I mean, if the red tide is present, uh, there is daily data available from Terra Aqua Modis instrument, as we just saw in, in the webinar. So that can be used to monitor a water body or location of, of your interest daily. And um, so I, I think one, um, if the water body is smaller than the satellite pixel, you probably won't see it. Or if the algal bloom area is uh, much smaller, Perhaps it will be difficult, but daily data are available um, from MODIS, so you can, you can attempt to monitor it. Um, again, um, our volume, um, it, I think it, I'm not sure whether you can, there are some um, recent algorithms they uh, attempt to do that, but basically you get chlorophyll concentration in the water, so say milligrams per liter or micrograms per liter is what you get of chlorophyll. Um, but uh, as mentioned here, the recent algorithms, they uh, determine how to get like cell biovolume. Uh, this is based on backscattering. This is not operationally available. It's still in research arena, so Sherry, perhaps you can add, but I think um, mostly from what we talked today, you get chlorophyll concentration. I have nothing to add, Anita. That's great. Okay. So Landsat um, 7 and 8, so this is question 3, both are uh,
currently flying so they can be used uh, so they each has 16 day revisit time but they have a week apart so you can have eight day uh, observations so they are referred to as lens at eight day but they're usually two like they're generally two lens at seven and eight are used um, there's one thing to keep in mind that at some point lens at seven etm plus uh, had an artifact uh, in the measurements and so there are some lines that you would see in the image uh, and that they need to be corrected also to keep in mind that uh, etm plus and oli um, i mean oli has one more band uh, than etm plus most of um, other bands are similar, but there is one deep blue uh, band in only, which is not there in ETM plus. So there is also a um, question about there are multiple tools such as Glowiz, LPDAC, um, Lancet, Lancet Look, and um, Earth Explorer. So why these multiple sites? So they all have slightly different features. They came up at different time. Um, actually, many of our webinars, uh, if you go to our set website, you will see, um, especially when we talk about um, Landsat data in, in land uh, webinars, there are demonstration how to use these uh, sites to get data. And there you can see different features. Everybody has personal preference. Some people like Clovis better. Some people like Earth Explorer better. But basically, each of them will provide you um, images and spectral uh, reflectances. So there is a question about ocean wave heights. That is um, ocean surface height measuring missions, which is not part of, it's beyond the scope of this webinar. But uh, you can look at any altimeter data, and they can provide uh, ocean surface height. So the question here is, can we have chlorophyll A data for any inland water body or lakes, regardless of size? Um, from remote sensing, uh, size is very important because satellite, res it depends on satellite resolution and, combi uh, and the water body size. If the lake or pond is just so small that um, it is within a satellite pixel, you cannot resolve it, and then you cannot use that uh, for remote sensing. As one of the questions, like uh, what's the minimum area? And so you uh, you need three to five clear satellite pictures within the water body to be able to have um, a retrieval of a chlorophyll A concentration. Question 12 is, uh, are we going to combine, in, uh, to, uh, are we going to show how to combine uh, satellite raw data and in situ measurements to produce your own data products? So this being an introductory webinar is uh, not going to cover that. Uh, we can provide you some references um, in the literature that how it is done. That would be a topic for advanced webinar where we actually show you how to put in situ data and um, remote sensing data together or how to develop an algorithm to, to produce your own, own data.
So again, question 13 is, So as uh, Sherry just um, typed, the um, design project that we're going to talk in week four uh, will address the, the question 13 here. It's about um, monitoring HAB in, in inland lakes. So um, question 14, um, again, to when you have large uh, sediment loading occurring um, and you also want to see chlorophyll and when there are no in-situ data, it, it is going to be difficult, but we can, uh, if you send an email, I will try and locate some papers where um, multiple what quality parameters are, are, are retrieved by using remote sensing data. I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sherry, but you, you do need some in-situ measurements to, to be able to use remote sensing more effectively. That's right, Amita. You really do need to be able to ground truth. Um, it's really tough. We have tried methods where we try to evaluate water quality in remote locations where we just can't get out there. And oftentimes what we have to fall back on is to say, okay, we are using all of this data, but we really can only make qualitative um, assessments from that if we don't have the, the sea truth or ground truth to validate. So question um, 15, uh, what, what you're saying here is that um, you have easy to data and then different algorithms, but they all overestimate. So one of the things my suggestion would be to look at would be how you do atmospheric correction. Sometimes that uh, may be one of the factors that can affect your retrieval. Amita, do you mind if I chime in? No, no, please do. Um, one thing that might be helpful, and I'm not familiar enough with the um, optical properties of the region, but um, there are other ways to estimate chlorophyll um, if you're talking about the five chlor or looking at five chlorophyll algorithms. Um, if there isn't a lot of sediment in the water, um, one approach that you could take would be the fluorescence line height, which is a different way to evaluate the phytoplankton biomass in the water. We, we're not talking about it much in this series. Um, in fact, I think we're not even talking about it at all. And so, um, but that might be one way to get around some of the problems that you may be having. Um, again, it, it works pretty well, but if there is a really high sediment load, it, it, it really breaks down very quickly. But um, it might be one approach. And again, that's called the fluorescence line height or normalized fluorescence line height approach. So the first homework um, you can find um, on the web page. There's a you can there's a link there, and it, uh, Elizabeth is typing here, so you can get the link. It's also in the chat box. So um, question 17, uh, the cloudiness uh, 
It is really an issue for all optical measurements. Um, sometimes um, you, you can look at surrounding cloud-free or partially cloudy regions and then uh, you'll be able to, uh, to gauge qualitatively um, what's going on. But cloudiness is a real issue. So, Anita, do you uh, mind if I jump in on 18? No, please do, because that's what I was going okay. to say. <laughs> okay. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I know a lot of the terrestrial remote sensing the um, folks receive already um, uh, computed products, and um, many of the portals that Amita has pointed you to is um, directing you towards portals that have the, um, the Chlorophyll A product. Um, and these are calculated after the atmosphere correction and other pre-processing steps have taken place. It is possible to get data that's a bit rawer and um, then process those data through, some, through CDAS, for example. So um, it is possible to get MODIS data and BEERS um, and some of these other satellites. Um, I don't personally work with the Sentinel series data, but it is possible to do it with those data sets as well. And then process it through atmosphere correction, choosing your own atmosphere correction parameters. And so um, it's, we're not taking you through those steps as a part of this webinar. We would love to have a level two webinar series where we can go into a lot more depth on this, these image processing tools if there is demand for it in the community. Um, but that's where you would go into the data and really get to some of these um, corrections that you would do yourself on the data sets. Um, Amita, I don't know if you have comments on Landsat and other sensors. You may be more familiar with working with those. But I know that at least for the aquatic optics side of things, we oftentimes process the data from a slightly more raw, like a level 1B. And then we go from there to compute our data products after we've done the atmosphere correction. So that is true for uh, people who derive their own products um, for their own water body. They start with raw data and do their own correction. Um, and there are there are um, programs, and one that comes to my mind is Ecolite that you know, many people use to correct data. USGS also has a uh, atmospheric correction algorithm, and I'm um, I'm going to find the name and let you know. Yeah, it, it is called C6. So that's the algorithm people use. It's, um, there, I think there are versions too to this, but basically they're used. Version for Modis as well as for uh, Lancet. So uh, there is a um, question here, can UAV uh, imagery be used for head monitoring? And absolutely, yes. Um, even um, like aircraft-based observations are, are also sometimes used, but uh, UAV can definitely be used. Uh, 
um, is it necessary to use a spectrometer to take samples? Um, I th um, if you're looking at optical observations of, from near surface, but for, for taking water samples, no. But I think if you're taking um, you're trying to get optical measurements of the water surface, then you would need a spectrometer, I would imagine, Sherry. That, uh, that's true, right? Yeah, if you want to validate what your radiometry is from your imagery, you would need to have the surface radiometry as well. And so um, you can reconstruct what that surface water leaving radiance would be by using those, in, those water measurements, like you wanted to collect water samples um, and filter the water or um, collect in water optics and then um, calculate it. But, um, but the surface spectral radiometer is what's going to provide for you that sea truth measurement. So you, you, the question uh, 22 is um, you're giving these algorithms and why they're overestimating in Bay of Bengal. So I guess that is really difficult to answer, not knowing what the um, Bay of Bengal optical properties are and how these algorithms do atmospheric corrections. Uh, maybe the best way to do is start with the raw data, do your own correction, uh, take your uh, in situ measurements, and then try and derive um, algorithm for yourself. And there are other algorithms that you can consult. In um, the answers that we're posting from last week, we provide a link to the table of many of these algorithms. So um, it is possible to find, because they're developed, many of them are empirically based, and so they're developed for different regions. Um, so it might be possible to find one that may be more appropriate for your environment. So I, I think question 23, uh, is it advisable to use MODIS chlorophyll A data in place of in situ measurements to validate model results? If you don't have any in situ measurements, then um, you will have to look at the remote sensing data such as MODIS chlorophyll A. But really, I think in situ measurements really are, are the key for validation. This way you will, you will be, you, I would say that if you look at um, your model data and satellite data, you may not get exact match, but if you look at the anomalies, then you might get a better idea that at least you are picking up the variability. Model is picking up the variability as the satellite is showing. Um, so see this, um, this question 24, see this is the one that um, allows you to to processing or look or even visualize the images and data. There are other tools like we just saw, Giovanni, um, they, that will allow you to explore satellite data without downloading. Um, Anita, on number 25 with the other coloring agents like phycocyanin and phycourethrin, um, there are algorithms that are out there that are trying to separate these, um, the phycocyanin um, from the spectrum to use it as a way to identify, okay, you see chlorophyll in the water, what about um, can we at least try to see if there's cyanobacteria in the water? And many cyanobacteria contain phycocyanin. And so um, 
uh, these algorithms are used in addition to these chlorophyll algorithms to first identify is there a bloom in the water and what's the likelihood of it being cyanobacteria. And I provided two links in the question, per, uh, question answer text, which will be arriving soon, um, in, the, um, in the question and answer for week one. And um, it provides just a starter where you can look to see where some of these algorithms are being developed. And if you wanted to learn more, to use the references those papers cite, or to look at more recent papers that cite those references, um, to then look beyond this. But there are algorithms trying to separate this from the ocean color data. So uh, uh, 27, um, you actually, you, you can also look at SSDs along with um, you can, although the color is not changing, I think if the chlorophyll concentration changes, it will have some effect on your spectral radiance um, and the, the ratio of uh, certain band reflectances. I believe that the, if you mon monitor that, then you will have some idea when to start uh, actually uh, go to the water body where the uh, potential have maybe. So Sherry, you can add to this uh, 28 is what's the most recent advancement in the remote sensing technology? So I think hyperspectral uh, measurements is uh, something that that can help in, in, in actually like distinguishing between different parameters such as sedum or chlorophyll A. Or, so I would say hyperspectral analysis, or hyperspectral measurements. Um, EO um, was one satellite which had a hyperspectral instrument. I think there is one on International Space Station. Heiko. Yeah, the Hyper uh, Hyperion was on the EO, and then Heiko, which is no longer operational, was on the ISS. Okay. But Hyperion is something like on EO, I think, had uh, hyperspectral uh, observations, yeah. and that, that can help. So that's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with you, Anita. It's, uh, the hyperspectral just provides so much more data that you can use to tease apart and do a real spectral analysis to separate different phytoplankton groups. And that goes a long way towards understanding um, what might be in the water. Another advancement that is really on the cutting edge of research, it's been in development for years, but they're really starting to push forward, is using marine LIDAR. And so using um, LIDAR at, they started with one wavelength, I think it's 532 nanometers, but they're starting to expand it so that we have multispectral LIDAR, both in water um, LIDAR, but also airborne LIDAR. And so using that, you can get a lot more information about the groups in terms of both what their absorbing properties are, but also their backscattering properties. So you can get down to questions like cell biovolume more directly than just inferring it from the imagery. So I'm really hopeful that between the hyperspectral satellites that may one day um, be um, uh, launched and um, the multispectral LIDAR that we're going to get even more information out of the ocean. Uh, number 30, uh, the Coast Watch node for the Great Lakes. Um, I know that at least when I've grabbed data off of the Coast Watch um, nodes, it's been in a net CDF format. And so I would encourage you to look at their node there. I would need to verify, and I can do so, um, if they provide that information um, from that node. Um, but if you're looking for net CDF, that would be the most likely of that region. That's probably the, your quickest route to get there. If you have more questions on that, whoever asked that question, feel free to send me an email. Um, and it's at the top of this page of these questions. So uh, question 29 uh, about satellite imagery working well in open oceans, but what about uh, coastal environment, um, such as bay or coast? And I think that's where uh, I would say Many efforts are done, and uh, Sherry um, is working on uh, coastal remote sensing. And so, um, I guess in situ measurements plus careful analysis of spectral bands. And if you have hyperspectral band data, that might be even better. So, I think analysis of in situ measurements as well as remote sensing data. Um, 
something like Landsat, which is uh, high resolution, and now, of course, MSI also has high resolution from Sentinel-2. So these data can be used more effectively for coastal regions. Um, Clovis um, has recently changed. Um, I'm not sure whether it will go away. So I uh, only correction, and I can give. I can you can, if you can send me the email. I'll send you the link. Uh, how only atmospheric correction is done. So if you go to USGS uh, OLE web page, Lancet data web page, there you may find information about that too. So based on chlorophyll A data, uh, can you retrieve turbidity? I don't think so. I think you will have to go to uh, spectral variances to to get any like turbidity also. There's a product called K490 that can be um, used as an estimate for particles in the water, and oftentimes in coastal environments they'll use that. So thank you for attending uh, today's session, and um, please go to the website to get the homework, um, and there's a link there. And um, we will see you next week at the same time.